shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. In other words, he's meek. And that's why he inherits the earth. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. What's it saying? Jesus is going to bring justice to the world. As the gospel of, of Christ and his lordship is embraced throughout the world, people adopt more just ways of living if they're really obedient to Christ. Of course, some people you know, adopt a, a Christian identity <coughs> of some sort, but they don't live for God. Real Christians who are real disciples who continue in his word, they live lives of justice toward other people. And they promote justice because they do mourn over injustices. Don't you? I would think you would. When you hear about horrible injustices, don't you mourn over those things? Blessed are you if you mourn. Blessed are you if you're hungry and thirsting for justice, for righteousness. That righteousness would fill the earth, that justice would fill the earth, that, that crime and abuse and oppression would no longer exist because... Justice prevails through the influence of Christ and his gospel. Now, I don't expect the world to be completely converted before Jesus comes back. I think when he comes back, the whole world will be completely filled with justice. But in the meantime, that's what we know his goal will be. He's going to bring justice to the nations. And they await his instruction. And he's going to not lose heart or falter until justice prevails throughout the earth. Jesus, God, in the Old Testament, is passionate about justice. We sometimes change the message of Jesus into primarily a message about how to go to heaven. In other words, a message about not this world, but the next. You know, many Christians don't give very much thought to how Christianity is supposed to impact their life in this world. They're thinking mainly about, whew, if I die, I'm going to heaven. In fact, for many of us, we're satisfied if people just die on their deathbed. I mean, except Christ on their deathbed, because... They got to heaven. They lived their whole life not serving God, but they got to heaven anyway, and that's good. It's all good. No, it's not all good. It's better. Better that they went to heaven than not, but it's not all good. They should have served God their whole life. Our desire is that people will live according to the law of our King, Jesus. That His Lordship will be embraced by every people, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. And if they do, they will live as if He is the Lord. And if they do, they will behave justly. They'll do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before their God. Those are the things that God cares about in the Old Testament, according to Micah 6 8. You know that passage? He has showed the old man what is good. What does the Lord require of you? It can come down to very few things. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. All those things are in the Beatitudes, by the way. Hungry and thirsty for justice. Now, he says, if you're hungry and thirsty for justice, you will be satisfied. So you're lucky. Blessed are you. Now, let's think about it. Everybody hungers for something. There are drives, goals, dreams that everyone in the whole world has for their life. They want to be happily married and have a family and a house with a white picket fence. Or they want to become famous and rich. Or they want something else. Everybody wants something. Most people want happiness. Most people want comfort. Most people want um, popularity. These are all things that people hunger and crave and work for. Whatever you hunger for, you will go after it. Your life will be drawn by your dreams, by your passions, by what it is you crave. You're going to go for it if you crave it. Now, hunger and thirst, those are the strongest physical passions that people have. Some of you young men might think sex is, but it's not. You can go a lot longer without sex than without food and water. Hunger and thirst are the most absolutely life-dominating passions of the physical life. Now, you need to have that kind of a hunger and thirst for justice. Because you know what? Though everyone has a hunger and a thirst for something that gives direction to their life and their pursuits, not everyone will be satisfied. 
I know some young people who have it's been their whole desire in life. They're almost 30 years old now. Christians originally, they've kind of drifted from the Lord because they're distracted. Their whole goal in life has become famous. They moved to Hollywood and they pursued fame. They're no more famous today than they were when they moved there 10 years ago. I don't think they ever will be. But they're craving it. They hunger and thirst for it. They may never be satisfied because they're hungering and thirsting for something that cannot be guaranteed to them. If you hunger and thirst after wealth or even a happy marriage, you may not even have one. You can't guarantee that your dreams will be fulfilled. I read an article recently. You know, the, there was a TV show called uh, Dirty Jobs. You know, did you ever see that? What's the guy's name is on that? Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe. I read an article by him. Did you read this about about following your dreams? He, said, he wrote a really good article saying, the worst advice anyone can give someone else is follow your dreams. He said, it's such a narcissistic assumption. Whatever your dreams are, you're entitled to them, go after them, even if they're unrealistic. He says, the better advice is do something that you do well, that can be productive, and you'll be surprised how satisfied you can be doing something that had nothing to do with your dreams. Most people, if they follow their dreams, they'll waste their whole life and their dreams will never be fulfilled, is what he's saying. And, and that's kind of a, a subtext to what Jesus is saying. Whatever you hunger and thirst for, you'll either be satisfied by its realization or you'll be dissatisfied because you won't reach it. If what you hunger and thirst for is righteousness and justice, you'll reach it. You will not be permanently unsatisfied because God is determined that even he will not fail or be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth. That's going to happen. If what you set your heart on is that God's righteousness and God's justice prevails in the world, that is not a pipe dream. That is a dream that God puts in the hearts of people who share his passion and he will fulfill it. You yourself will become a more just person for one thing. And that is very satisfying. If you love justice, it's good to know you did the right thing when you could have done something wrong. It's a very satisfying thing to have a clear conscience. And especially when you're in trials or in conflicts. If you know, well, I, I, this is an un uncomfortable situation, but at least I know I did what God wanted me to do. And having a clear conscience in trouble gives you tremendous strength in trials. If you are in trials and you realize this happened because I did that stupid sinful thing and now I'm reaping the consequences that's a bitter bitter experience to go through trials knowing that you brought it on yourself like Joseph's brothers when they're having those problems getting the grain and and Joseph this stranger to them in Egypt was uh, giving them all kinds of problems they, they said this is because we did that to Joseph so long ago they, their conscience was afflicting them their troubles were upon them and they didn't have a clear conscience they knew this happened because they had done unjust things but when you know you did the just thing you know you did the sacrificial thing you know you didn't hurt anybody you didn't violate anyone's rights you know that you were fair and, and, and just in your dealings even if you get persecuted for that and he talks about that in the last beatitude blessed are you if you're persecuted for justice or righteousness same, same thing you may get persecuted for justice, but there's this blessedness of knowing at least God is pleased. These people may hate me. They might even kill me, but you know, there's something there satisfying to know that God was pleased with what I did. Having justice is satisfying. Being a just person and pursuing the expansion of a just society. And some people think, well, that's, that sounds like the social gospel. Aren't we supposed to be talking about you know the kingdom of God yes exactly the kingdom of God your kingdom come your will be done where on earth as it is in heaven that's all it's talking about God wants what does he do he wants you to do justly his will be done on earth is that justice will prevail that's what he wants what is justice justice is simply you say one person is not violating the legitimate rights of another person. The Ten Commandments have a great deal of concern for justice. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What do those mean? Honor your father and your mother. What? Your father and your mother have a right to your respect. They, they sacrificed a great deal so that you could come into the world and survive into adult life. They spent a lot of money, gave up a lot of freedom. 
gave up the best years of their life, the most productive and potentially the most fun years of their lives. They gave it up so that you could be here and that you could do okay. You owe them something. The Bible says you owe your parents. It's justice. If you don't honor your parents, that's injustice. You're depriving them of something they really deserve. They deserve your respect. They deserve that you take care of them when they're old, Paul said. He said you need to repay your parents when they're old. He called it a repayment. Why? Because it's an unjust thing to receive so much from someone and not respect them for it. You're, they, they earned your respect. You might say, my parents weren't that respectable. Yeah, that's true. Parents are not perfect and many of them are very imperfect. But if you're alive today, either your natural parents or someone else who is like a parent to you, took care of you when you weren't able to do it. And they are your de facto parents. You, you owe them respect. Thou shalt not kill. Why? Because people have a right to live unless they do something that gives up that right to live. If I commit murder, I give up my right to live and I, it's a capital crime. If I don't do anything that's a capital crime, I don't deserve to be put to death. You kill me, that's an injustice. You're depriving me of my, my natural right to live. You take my stuff, you shall not steal. You're, my right to my property is being violated. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I have a right to have my wife to myself. That's how marriage is, you know, not share with other people. Someone goes in there and, and commits adultery there, they're violating my rights. You see, the commands of God are all about maintaining justice. And justice is, you've got to recognize that people have certain rights that you should not overstep. If, you, if no one overstepped anyone else's rights, there'd be no crime. There'd be no war. There'd be very little conflict. This is what God wants, and He wants us to hunger and thirst for a world like that, and for it in our own lives. And He says, guess what? That's, that's the target you aim at. You'll be satisfied. You're going to hit that target. That, that's going to happen someday. Not today, perhaps, but someday. You will be satisfied. And that is a promise that cannot be made to people who hunger and thirst for other things. Some people hunger and thirst for other things and do get them. And I would even be willing to say they're satisfied because they set their sights so low. You know, some Christians say, oh, you'll never be satisfied in sin. Well, I think some people are, frankly. Christians sometimes say what they think ought to be true, but isn't necessarily true. Some sinners are very satisfied in their sin. But that's because they set their sights on satisfaction so low, and it's not permanent. But though some who don't pursue righteousness may reach their goals and find satisfaction, most will not. And there's no guarantee that any will, unless your goal is what God's goal is. If you say, I'm on God's agenda, I'm on God's project, I'm doing what God wants, what He wants done is that righteousness and justice prevail, that's what I want to and that's what I'm aiming at. That, that's my dream. My dream is to see God honored in all the behavior of all the people that He's created everywhere, that every knee is going to bow to His Lordship and they're going to be honoring His Lordship by their obedience and justice will prevail in their lives and the lives of their societies because of them. That's my dream. That's a dream that is going to be fulfilled. That you'll be satisfied if that's your dream. Anything else? No guarantees. You're a happy person if you have that dream because you're one of the few that can be guaranteed that what you're hungry for is going to be satisfied. And uh, so, so he says they're in the fourth beatitude, okay? Um, there's a lot of Stuff I can't say here. I was going to point out some other places in the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about justice. Uh, but I'm going to have to move along because we're going to run out of time here too quickly. The uh, fifth beatitude, verse 7, is it? It says, um, I don't know why I keep losing my place here. I'm all over the Bible, I guess. Uh, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Um... This essentially is a principle you find in the Old Testament as well as the New. It says in the Old Testament, He that has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him what he has given. In other words, I'm merciful to a poor person in a tangible way. He's poor, I give him something. God counts that as a loan. I'm lending to the Lord. And God says, now I'll take care of you when you need it. If you're merciful to others, you will obtain mercy. Now, if you aren't merciful to others, you will not. James said, Ju judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. 
in James it says that judgment is without mercy to those who have shown no mercy. Being merciful to others is, Jesus said, uh, a blessing because your God will treat you mercifully if you've done that. It's similar to the idea of, you know, you use the same standard to judge others that you want to be judged by yourself. Do I want God to show mercy to me? Then I need to show mercy to other people. And Jesus does unpack this in the Sermon on the Mount uh, in more ways than one. For example, in chapter 5, which is our present chapter, verses 43 through 48, it says, You have heard the law that says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust alike. Now he says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for you in that? Even corrupt tax payers, payers do that. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. This last line has bothered many Christians, obviously. Be perfect as your Father in heaven. Is that really realistic? It is. Because the word perfect doesn't always mean what we mean by perfect. The Greek word has three meanings. And it's translated all three ways in the Bible, different places. It means perfect, but also can mean complete. And it can also mean mature. In this case, he clearly means complete because he's saying your mercy and your kindness should not be selective, but should be universal. Be completely merciful, not only to your friends, anyone can do that, be completely merciful to everybody, not just your friends, but even your enemies. Love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. In Luke, it goes on to say, and you know, pray for those who despitefully use you and do good to those who harm you and so forth. This is giving undeserved kindness to people. This is mercy. Blessed are the merciful. When you give undeserved kindness to people, that is what mercy is. And Jesus said, so you'll be like your Father in heaven. You know what? In Luke's parallel to these verses we just read, where Jesus said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Luke, in the parallel statement, says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. So when the word perfect there means completely merciful. Not perfect in every way necessarily, but at least your mercy is not doled out selectively. You are comprehensively merciful. You are thoroughgoingly merciful. You are completely, perfectly merciful. Meaning, not selectively, but you love the, the, those who don't deserve it as much as the ones who do. You do kindness to people, not because they did kindness to you or are likely to do kindness back to you. You do kindness to people even if they never will do you any good, just like God sends his sunlight on the evil and on the good, causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. God doesn't only do good to his friends, he does good to everybody. Be like him. Let your mercy be comprehensive as his is. That's, so actually this be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you look over at Luke 6, the same conversation. Instead of be perfect, it's be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. So mercy is, among other things, doing acts of undeserved kindness, even to your enemies. That's merciful. There's another way that mercy is shown, and that is in forgiving others. Now, forgiveness is only done when somebody has really done something wrong and they don't deserve to be forgiven. If someone deserves your kindness or your kind-heartedness toward them, then they, it's not mercy. But forgiveness is only appropriate or is only called forgiveness when it's undeserved. Somebody has wronged you, they don't deserve to be forgiven, but you forgive them anyway. Forgiveness is giving up your right to retaliate. Forgiveness is giving up your right to punish the person who hurt you. You do have that right. I mean, perfect justice would be, someone hits me in the eye, I hit him in the eye. That's justice. No one can complain about justice, but there's a higher way to go. And that is to be merciful too. I can make sure that I don't hit somebody else's eye. That's because I want to be a just person. But if someone hits me in the eye, I want to be a merciful person. 
justly I could hit him back, but turning the other cheek is showing mercy. And so forgiveness is being merciful. Doing acts of kindness to people who don't deserve it, forgiving people who've done things that they really don't have any right to claim forgiveness, but you do it anyway, because God forgives you. And Jesus makes it very clear, even in, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he gives the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6, he says we're to pray, among other things, in chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. We are authorized to pray for forgiveness to the same extent that we have forgiven others, and not beyond that. And at the end of that prayer, in verse 14, chapter 6, verse 14, says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. You know, if you're merciful, you'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. You forgive others, God will forgive you. That's the very principle of that beatitude. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. There's a lengthy parable later in Matthew in chapter 18 where Peter came to Jesus and you may remember it. In verse 21 he said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Uh, seven times? That sounds pretty magnanimous, doesn't it? And Jesus said, well, yeah, excellent, but you know, it's not just, that's just starting. You need to do it 70 times seven. And he said, it's like a man, there was a man who was owed a huge debt to a king. And the king called him in to pay the debt, and the man didn't have the money. And so the king said, I'm going to sell you into slavery to pay your debt. And the man begged him for mercy, so the king had compassion on him, and he just forgave him the debt. Just canceled it. The man was forgiven. The man went out, and he found a fellow servant who owed him a very tiny amount of money, a small debt, and said, pay me what you owe. And the man said, please, have mercy. I'll pay you when I can. I can't do it now. And the, the forgiven man did not forgive his fellow servant and had him thrown into debtor's prison. Well, Jesus said at the end of that parable, this is Matthew 18, the very closing verses, he says, when the Lord of that servant heard that, he was angry and he delivered him over to tormentors until he should pay what was owed. It's kind of like he unforgave him. And he says, so also shall my heavenly Father do to you if you do not every man from his heart forgive his brother's trespasses. Now what's interesting is the parable is long, but the part that Jesus said is about God is what the master did. He forgave, but his forgiven servant didn't forgive, and so the master unforgave, threw him into over the tormentors until he should pay all he owed. And Jesus said, and that's what my father will do to you. He's talking to Peter. He's not talking to pagans. Talk to the apostles. He's alone with his apostles in Matthew 18. That, he's in a house with them. And Peter asked him this question. Jesus says to his own apostles, what that king did to his unforgiving servant, delivering him over to tormentors until he should pay what he's owed, that's what my father will do to you. It's, there's there's, there's a, a seamless, there's no way to l get around this. My father will do this to you if you don't forgive. The merciful and only the merciful will obtain mercy. Mark? Have you ever heard it uh, said that when Jesus said that to Peter about the uh, forgiveness of uh, seven, 70 times 7, that that was kind of reversing the curse of Lamech, uh, that his was based on revenge, and that he was teaching forgiveness, and Lamech used the same term of 70 times 7, of vengeance. boasting of, of revenge, and that Jesus was basically reversing that curse of Lamech. It could be. It could be, yeah. In Genesis 4, Lamech, a descendant of Cain, told his two wives that he had killed a man in self-defense. And he said, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, which was in fact what God himself had declared, that, God, that Cain would be avenged sevenfold, he says, then Lamech shall be avenged seventy times seven, or seventy-sevenfold. Uh, seventy times seven, I think he said. And um, so, so that's really kind of him claiming his right to avenge himself that much. And Jesus says, no, you need to forgive that much. So I don't know if Jesus has that in mind, but he could easily have it in mind. It's certainly a, you know, two sides of a similar coin. Some people have thought it might have something to do with the 70 weeks of Daniel, because there were 70 sevens there too, but I can't see the connection. That seven is a very common number in Scripture. Seventy times seven is probably a term that's useful for more than one kind of application. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's such a contrast there between Lamech's attitude and what Jesus recommends. 
So Jesus makes it clear that to, be, to expect mercy from God, you need to be a merciful person yourself. Of course you will be if you're poor in spirit, if you're meek, if you're one who mourns, if you love justice, and so forth. You know, if, you, if, if these other traits are descriptive of you, then being merciful to other people will be your inclination. Realizing how much you need the mercy of God and how little you deserve it more than anyone else does. You don't deserve mercy, and so this other person who doesn't deserve your mercy, well, what's, what's him deserving it have to do with it? Mercy means undeserved, you know? I'm either going to be merciful or not. If I am, it's going to be undeserved. But thankfully, I, since I receive mercy and expect to continue to receive mercy from God, I am obviously going to... I love mercy. If I love mercy, I better extend mercy. And so that beatitude, we move from to the, the sixth beatitude in verse 8. In verse 8, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. This is almost certainly an allusion back to Psalm 24. Psalm 24, David asks uh, a question. In verse 3, Psalm 24, 3 says, who may, uh, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He's talking about who may enter into God's house and commune with God. Who may, in other words, be welcomed by God into his presence, as opposed to not being welcomed into that place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure. The only people who can stand before God and be welcomed there are those whose hearts are pure. And so Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. It only makes sense based on the statement in Psalm 24, 4. Well, okay, so what does it mean to have a pure heart? That sounds like a steep order. That sounds like a really high bar. Well, it is, it is a high bar, but uh, purity of heart really comes down to a fairly simple concept. Purity means undiluted or unmixed. Pure water is simply water that doesn't have anything else in it. Uh, it's actually, the, uh, you'd think, the natural state of water until something is added to it would be pure. Pure is not such a lofty and rare thing. Pure is just something that's unmixed. Now, purity of heart. The heart in Scripture speaks of your inner motivations, of your inner thoughts and your inner desires and your inner... Uh, the things that move you. You live your, heart, your life from your heart. Jesus said, it's out of the heart of man that proceed, and he lists a whole bunch of evil things. In, uh, he said that in Matthew 5, 19 and 20. All these evil behaviors, he said, they defile man, they come from the heart. The heart is this, the command center of the life, and purity of heart refers to, I think, purity of motivation. To have a heart after God purely would mean that you have only a concern for God and for His happiness and for His will. That you've pretty much repented of selfish interests and put God's interest in their place. When Jesus said, Father, I, I'd like it a lot if you'd let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours. It's not about my will, I want your will. And that's the attitude of a Christian too. Whatever God wants. My heart has only one driving concern, and that is that God is pleased. I have a God focus in my heart, and it's not mixed with ulterior motives. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. The people who give alms to the poor, but they do it to be seen by men. Their motive is not to please God. Their motive is to be seen by men. Externally, they're doing religious things. But they're hypocrites. They sound a trumpet before them before they give a gift so everyone's paying attention. He says they have their reward. In other words, the reward they're looking for is people's attention. Well, they've got it. Unfortunately, that's a pretty low reward to settle for, but that's all they're getting. They've got the reward they're looking for, and I hope they're happy because they're not getting any more. But he said when you do alms, you go do it privately, and the Lord will reward you openly. 
Your reward will be later. Likewise, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. He continually points out how the Pharisees were ostentatious and outward in their show, in their prayers, in their giving of alms, in their fasting, because they wanted to be seen by men. And he always says they do it to be seen by men, and they have their reward. They, what they want is what they have. Human attention. They've got it. How sad for them that they settle for so little when you could have God's approval. God who looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, God told Samuel. Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Your heart, if your heart is pure, if what you're doing unto the Lord is pure, it doesn't have to impress other people. Your prayers don't have to be eloquent. Some people don't like to pray out loud because I just feel stumbling and I, I, so many people pray so much better than I do. Well, how do you know they pray better than you do? You don't know what's in their heart. But they're so much more eloquent. They pray such more wonderful words than I can think of. True, but is God looking for the words or the heart? It's what's in the heart. The, the Pharisees prayed wonderful flowery prayers, but just to be heard by men, they had their reward. God wasn't pleased. Jesus said, when you pray, you can go in your closet and pray, and God will reward you openly. And the purity of heart is what I do toward God or toward man in a religious way, whether it's a, a, a generosity on my part to the poor, whether it's a religious action like praying or fasting, I can either be doing it out of a motive for human approval or for God's approval, or a little of both. I kind of hope God likes this, but I kind of hope these people like it too. That mixture is what's not pure. If you're doing it for man's approval or partly for man's approval and not strictly for God's approval, your heart isn't pure. The pure heart is one that's unmixed in its motives. I got one motive only. David said, one thing I've desired from the Lord, and that alone will I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I might meditate in his temple and behold the beauty of the Lord. He only had one thing he was interested in, the Lord. I want to dwell in his house on good terms with him. I want, to, I want him to reveal his beauty to me. I want to see the beauty of the Lord. He said, that's the one thing I've desired. Not two. It's not the top on a list. It's the only thing. This will I seek. Psalm 27, 4. When Mary was listening to Jesus, Mary, the, the sister of Martha, was listening to Jesus, Martha was serving in the other room. Martha was doing what people expected to do in that society, being a hostess, doing all the stuff she felt people expected a hostess to do. More or less pleasing man. Mary was kind of neglecting what hostesses were expected to do. She's kind of just hanging on Jesus' every word. And Martha complained, and Jesus said, Martha, you're, you're concerned about many things, but Mary has chosen the one thing needful, and it will not be taken from her. There's one thing needful. What is that? That Jesus is your whole focus. Yeah, you may have to go and serve in the kitchen sometime if he wants you to, but if you're focusing on him, you'll know that he wants you to. Martha didn't even ask. Martha just assumed she knew what Jesus wanted to do, and it's what society expected a hostess to do. Go in there, serve a meal, do these things. She didn't even ask if Jesus wanted her to do that. She did the right things, but to please man. Mary neglected what would be considered to be the right thing, but she was pleasing the Lord because she was listening to the Lord. She was focused on Jesus. A heart that's wholly focused on God is the purity of heart that David is talking about and, and that Jesus talks about in this passage too. They will see God. Now, the seventh Beatitude says, Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the sons of God. Why will they be called the sons of God? Because sons, or children of God, because children inherit traits from their parents <coughs> very commonly um, I just met for the first time yesterday uh, Danny Lehman's grandson Daniel's son I think it's Zane is it now I knew Danny before Daniel was born in fact Danny and Linda came down and did a wedding uh, uh, for me in uh, Orange County in 1980 and Daniel was in a baby carrier. They brought him down from Santa Cruz and he was in a baby carrier. Daniel. Now this is his son Zane. And I was thinking, boy, he looks so much like I remember his dad looking when he was young. He's like a spitting image of him. And of course people say that a lot. Oh, you're the 
spit an image of your father, your chip off the old block. It's so often true. You can tell whose child someone is often because they've inherited traits that you've seen in their parents. Now God has certain traits, they're spiritual traits because he's not physical. And those who share his spiritual disposition can be recognized. Their relationship to him can be recognized by that similarity. Is God a peacemaker? Oh yes, yes he is. First of all, he makes peace between his own enemies and himself. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself and not counting their sins against them. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it's verse 21. God reconciled the hostile world to himself. He's a peacemaker. In Christ, he made peace between himself and his enemies. But more than that, he makes peace between people. He promotes peace not just between himself and his enemies, but between two people who are enemies of each other, as in Ephesians 2, where he took the Jew and the Gentile, he broke down the hostility, the middle wall of partition between them, and made in himself one new man, so making peace. God makes, he's a peacemaker. He's made peace between himself and sinners by the death of Christ. He has made peace between Jews and Gentiles and other parties who don't like each other by bringing them together into one body through, in the same spirit, in the unity of the spirit. God is a peacemaker. If you want to look like him, if you want to be recognized as his seed, you need to be a peacemaker too. This business of turning the other cheek is a peacemaking thing to do. If someone strikes you, they're trying to provoke you. You can retaliate and then it escalates. And it'll keep escalating until someone says, you know what, I'm just going to let you have that. You know, it's like, it's like in an argument that's going on and on and on. Both people are too proud to give up. Because they can both think of something to say. When you just say, you know what, I'm going to let you have the last word about that. You know, I, I, I don't like being not at peace. In Psalm 120, um, I think it's verses 4 and 5. No, it's 5 and 6. Psalm 120, verses 5 and 6. The psalmist says, I have dwelt too long with those who hate peace. He says, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. You ever felt that sentiment? I'm trying to be friendly, but they just want to be enemies. I'm for peace, but every time I talk, they want to make war. Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12, in verse 18, he said, as much as lies in you, if it is possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. That as much as lies in you, and if possible, means that it won't always be possible. You can be a peacemaker, but peace requires two people participating. You can determine whether you'll be a peacemaker. You can't determine whether the other person will. There will be times when you're a peacemaker, but peace will not prevail, just like with God. God has reached out to make peace with the world. Some of them are still his enemies. They don't want him. You sometimes hear people say, you know, when there's a divorce, there's no innocent party. Both parties are wrong. Well, a lot of times that's true, but frankly, there can be one party in a marriage that's a peacemaker trying to save the marriage, and the other one just wants war. You cannot guarantee peace between you and anyone else, but you can guarantee that you will not be the cause of the conflict, that you will not be the wrongdoer, that, and, and that when you see two people who are not at peace with each other, that you come in as a reconciling agent. Like, that's being like God. When you come and try to restore peace or there's conflict. That is something God loves to do. Just like he loves justice, he loves peace. Shalom in the Old Testament is one of the most important words in the Old Testament. It speaks of a holistic kind of peace that kind of envelops all of the areas of your life. At peace with yourself, at peace with your, the world, at peace with your enemies, at peace with God. Shalom. This is a great thing. Those who promote this peace are promoting the kingdom of God. Paul said, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it is righteousness and peace. That is justice and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God that we're promoting is justice and it is peace. So we have to be peacemakers as well as hunger and thirst for justice. And so Jesus is placing these before his disciples as the highest priorities. And then, of course, the last beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for doing right. Actually, in the Greek, it's for justice or for righteousness sake. Uh, for doing what's right, 
for promoting justice, you get persecuted. Why? Why would anyone persecute you for promoting what's right? Because they don't want what's right. S the sinful world loves its sin. And when you come in as light and in the world, the glaring light is not welcomed by people who love to do their deeds in the darkness. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You see, the salt put into a wound may help the wound to heal, but it stings. And lots of people don't want to be healed in the way that God wants them to be healed. They don't want to be made right. They like their sin. They don't want to be cured of that. And we are an influence for curing the world's woes through the gospel. Some people don't want that cure. And when the salt is applied, it stings and they react negatively and they persecute rather than appreciate. You know, Peter said something interesting in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 and verse 4. He said, your old friends think it strange that you don't run with them to the same excessive riotous behavior and they speak evil of you. They persecute you. They speak evil of you because they don't understand why you're not running their way anymore. You see, when you follow Jesus in a world that isn't following Jesus, your life, if you don't speak a word, your life is condemning their behavior. Because everyone else by default is going the way of sin. And you've said, I think I want to go the other way. And just making the decision to go the other way, you're saying that's the wrong way. That's why I don't want to go that way. I want to go the right way. And simply by turning around, you're condemning their behavior. And when people see you turn around and follow God, they feel convicted and condemned because they realize in their conscience they should do that too, but they don't want to. And by you doing it, you're saying they're on the wrong path. You're not saying it out loud, maybe. You might not have said a word about it, but they are, your life is condemning them. It says about Noah in Hebrews 11 that by faith he built an ark and he condemned the world by doing so. How did Noah condemn the world? Just because he was the only guy following God. And by contrast, the whole world looked bad. You know, if everyone's going bad and no one's going good, bad doesn't seem bad. R.C. Sproul said that when he was in college, there was one really hard exam that was given by one of his professors. And almost everyone flunked the exam. And the, and the professor was so disgusted that the next day as he handed out the papers to the students, he, he read their name and read their grade. You know, Joe Smith, zero. Susan J Jones, zero. One name, one zero after another. Zero, zero, zero. Failed, failed, failed. Everyone failed except Sally Wilson, 100%. Now, R.C. Sproul said, do you think this, the students stood up and cheered for Sally Wilson? They groaned. They booed. How dare she get 100% on a test that they all failed? If she had failed too, they could complain the test was unfair. No one could pass the test like that, but someone did. Uh-oh, that means we could have, but we didn't. Her, she broke the curve. Her success condemned their failure. If, if they had all failed, everyone feels okay. As soon as one person says, you know, that's not right. I'm doing the right thing. Everyone else who's doing the wrong thing says, oh, so you're so holier than thou? And they speak evil of you, Peter said. You don't run with them the same way and they speak evil of you. Sometimes they do worse than speak. Sometimes they persecute, even kill. The world hates righteousness until it's converted. Uh, that is, until a, a person is converted, they don't love righteousness. Now, some people begin to love righteousness before they're converted because God is drawing them. Sometimes when you meet somebody who's already has a hunger for righteousness, but they're not a Christian yet. There's people in other religions who are not converted to Christ yet, but they really want what's good. I know some Muslim, I have a Muslim friend who's a really good-hearted guy, and he really wants what's right. But he's not quite ready to accept Christ. He just is, you know, there's a lot of cultural and relational bondage there. But I don't think he's far from the kingdom. Remember when a, a, a scribe said to Jesus, what's the great commandment? And Jesus said, well, what do you think it is? 
And he said, well, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus said, that's right. You're not far from the kingdom. You're not in it yet. You're not yet a follower of mine, but I can tell you're thinking in the right direction. You're coming around. And there are always people that are coming around because the Holy Spirit is drawing them, and they haven't yet learned of Christ or surrendered to Christ, but they're on their way. I call some people like that, I call them pre-Christians rather than non-Christians, because I think God's drawing them, they're going to be saved, they're going to come to Christ. But, but there are other people, and, and in the majority, who don't want that. And when they find you walking in a way of righteousness, that condemns them, and they don't like being condemned. And so they persecute. And Jesus said, don't worry, you're like the prophets. That's the, Jesus, you're like Jesus. Jesus was persecuted, and so were the prophets. So you're in good company at least. And you're blessed to be in that company because those who avoid persecution by moral compromise, they're in the company of the people who are not going to be happy when Jesus comes back. So you're blessed if you pursue these things. These are not the, world, the world's values. In most cases, they're the opposite of the world's values. But they're the way of happiness. And you know, if, if it wasn't different than what we thought, we might wonder why Jesus even had to come in the first place. If everyone already knows the truth, if everyone already knows what's right and, and stuff, what, you know, why did Jesus have to teach? He could have come and died, but he wouldn't have to teach. His teaching was to turn us around in our thinking, to renew our minds, to get us thinking like God thinks again, and to value what God values. And so we could be happy and blessed and inherit the kingdom of God and inherit the world. And so that's what those Beatitudes are about. There's so much more I wanted to say, but we're out of time, so I'm going to just, I know you wanted to have some... Uh, some time to decompress or something. So. <laughs> I did a little bit of processing this morning. So if you, if oh, you did some of that this morning? Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll just take questions, okay? I could lecture more, but why get started again for 10 minutes? So if you have any questions, I'll be glad to talk about them. And remember, Monday night, we're going to have just open questions, too. And that's not just about this material. That's about whatever is in the Bible you want to talk about. Anyone have any need for clarification? Yes. yes. So yesterday when you were teaching... Hold on real quick. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So yesterday when you were teaching about um, one of the prophecies, uh, the Bible says, Jeremiah says right. so, uh -huh. but it was actually found somewhere else. In Zechariah. Yeah. And then... Yeah. And then um, so you said you can accept that there might be a um, mistake, it might be a mistake. Then how do we balance that with, um, uh, I think it's Timothy, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.16. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. If there are possibly mistakes, for example, Paul forgetting who he baptized and then reminding, then later remembering <coughs> in the Bible, how does that coincide with 2 Timothy 3.16? which says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for <coughs> correction, for instruction in righteousness and so forth, for doctrine. And uh, so if all scripture is inspired by God, how could there be any mistakes? <coughs> well, first of all, two parts of this. First of all, Paul is talking about the Old Testament because when Paul wrote that, there was no New Testament yet. Okay, the church didn't have a New Testament when Paul wrote that. He was, it was still being written, okay? And in the previous verse, he says how Timothy, from his childhood, had been taught in the Holy Scriptures. Now, Timothy certainly wasn't taught from his childhood in the New Testament. Again, none of it was written when Timothy was being raised, and most of it wasn't yet, a lot of it wasn't yet written when Paul was writing. So the New Testament didn't exist yet. Some of the documents were being written at the time, but they, the, what we call the New Testament was not Scripture yet. And Paul is referring to the Old Testament, which was written by prophets who were inspired by God. A prophet, of course, is one who speaks it like an oracle. The Holy Spirit gives him words to speak, and he speaks directly. If he speaks incorrectly, he's a false prophet. So a true prophet does speak infallibly, and Paul does talk about the, the prophecies that way. Likewise, Peter does. In 2 Peter 1.19, he says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the holy men of God did not speak 
according to the will of men, but as the Holy Spirit moved them. Now, he's talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. The, uh, a prophet speaks directly by inspiration. Now, the New Testament was written by apostles. They, generally speaking, the apostles never claimed inspiration for themselves. They just claimed that they knew what they're talking about and could be trusted. When the writers of the Gospels wrote, they didn't say they were inspired. Luke said that he was an expert on the subject, and that he'd done much research and had talked to the eyewitnesses, and therefore you should trust him. But they never indicated whether or not they were inspired. Now, I was raised in an evangelical home where we just assumed the whole Bible is written by inspiration and flawless. And I say, okay, well, that's fine. I, I've never had any reason to challenge that, except when I read it. And when I read it where I found out, wait a minute, they didn't say that. Why did my church tell me that? I believe that the New Testament, written by apostles, is 100% authoritative. But whether it was written under inspiration or not, we're not told. And if we're not told, how would we know? Neither Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John claimed they were writing under inspiration, except for the book of Revelation, and a couple of passages in Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he basically gives an oracle. He says, come apart and be separate from them, says the Lord, and I will be your father and you'll be my children. I will walk among you. Paul actually speaks like an oracle, like a prophet for a moment there. Speaks in the first person as if he's inspired like a prophet. And also, of course, in 1 Timothy, or 2, I think it's 1, he says, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days many shall depart from the faith and so forth. Now when he says the Spirit speaks expressly, he's speaking, I, he says, I'm inspired. This is, the, this is what the Spirit of God is saying. Now, so from time to time, Paul will say, okay, what I'm giving you right now is an inspired word from the Holy Spirit. The rest of the time, He'll say things like, I have no word from the Lord about this, but I'll give you my judgment. In other words, I'll give you my opinion about this. Now, some people say, well, it's only Paul's opinion. I can ignore it. Really? <laughs> An apostle of Christ, one who is caught into the third heaven and heard things he couldn't even repeat, this man's opinion is as good as yours? You know, I believe everything Paul said is true, except where he corrected himself and said, oh, I said I only baptized Christmas and guests, but I forgot I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Okay, so he made a, a technical mistake there. That technical mistake tells us several things. One is he's, he's not claiming that this is an oracle coming from God or else he wouldn't make that mistake. Secondly, he corrected himself. So he's not trying to fool you. He just had a lapse there for a moment and, and he even says, and I don't remember if I baptized any others after that. Paul. Paul is writing letters like you would write letters. The difference is, you're not him. <laughs> when Paul sat down to write a letter, as far as I know, there was no more magic going on in his brain than when you sit down to write a letter. But he was the Apostle Paul. And as the Apostle Paul, he was commissioned by Jesus Christ to speak authoritatively to the church, and what he spoke had to be believed and followed by the church as with the other apostles. And so, I know this will bother some people, but I'm, I'm just trying to say what the Bible actually says and not beyond what it says. It, I, when I realized this, I realized I could still maintain my, my, the, the belief in my upbringing that the New Testament was written under inspiration too, even though it never claims to be. And I could still believe that even though Paul didn't know that he had a word from the Lord, and he said he didn't, yet he still did. Like he says, I have no word from God about this. I'll give my opinion. Well, no, wait a minute. No, Paul, you don't realize you do have a word from the Lord. You're just not aware of it. Because my evangelical theology tells me that you're inspired, even if you don't think you are. Well, if Paul didn't think he was, where did I get the idea that he was? If he didn't know it, how do I know it? The truth is, I've become much more common sense in my approach to the Bible as I've gotten older, realizing that why do I have to make claims for the New Testament that it doesn't make for itself when the claims it does make for itself are enough? Every one of the Gospel writers tell us that they're telling the true story of what Jesus said and did. That's good enough for me. By the way, I could write a biography of someone I knew intimately and I could tell true story. I wouldn't have to be inspired, but if you read my biography, you'd find out about that person. An accurate account. All I need is the truth. Just tell me the truth about Jesus. Well, those four gospel writers did tell the truth. They, they said they did, and I believe they did. That's all I need to know. Was there something else going on too, something called inspiration? I don't know. 
They didn't know it. They didn't say so. Maybe. Maybe not. Who cares? Why would I even care? As long as what they're saying is true, because I want the truth. I'm not looking for some kind of... Uh, I'm not looking for something that I can say, this came magically to us in a way that other things don't come to us. The prophecies did come that way. Prophecy is direct revelation. That's why the prophets say, thus says the Lord. And they speak in the first person as God. I, 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 God says through the prophets. The New Testament writers don't do that, generally. Instead, they say, Jesus did this, God did that, God said that, and they, they basically report as, as you would expect an apostle to do. They were commissioned to be spokesmen for God, but not prophets. Paul made a distinction between apostles and prophets. He said God gave first apostles, secondarily prophets. He was an apostle. There were others who were prophets. One of the prophets, we don't know very many in the New Testament, well, one of them we do know about is Agabus. How did he speak? Not like Paul. Agabus said, Thus saith the Lord, So shall the man be bound who owns this girdle when he comes to Jerusalem. Or thus says the Lord, There will be a great famine that will affect the whole world. You know, it's Agabus, a New Testament prophet, spoke the same way an Old Testament prophet does. The apostles didn't. They weren't prophets. They were apostles. An apostle's authority is based on his commission, not on his subjective inspiration. However, we have to realize that those that Jesus commissioned, he also revealed things to. Like Paul was caught up in the third heaven and learned all kinds of that's Whatever he learned there was inspired stuff. You know? He received his gospel by direct revelation from God. He even received his knowledge of the mystery of Christ by inspiration, by direct revelation. But when he wrote about it, he said, I hope you understand my knowledge of this subject. In, in Ephesians 3, 5, he says, When I write, I hope you understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which was revealed to me. Okay, the information was revealed to Paul, supernaturally. But when he's writing it, He's just hoping you recognize he's writing from something he knows. How does he know? Well, God revealed it to him. Good enough for me. But was he writing under inspiration at that moment? If he was, he didn't know it, didn't say it. And I don't have any necessary reason to believe it. So if he says, I don't remember if I baptized anyone more than Crispus and Gaius in the household of Stephanus. And at first I thought it was just Crispus and Gaius, but now I remember it's Stephanus too. And I'm not sure about others. You know, I think that sounds like a normal person writing a letter, you know, not like somebody who's channeling, you know, word for word something from God. But does he have to? If I knew a man who had been caught up in the third heaven, that Jesus had appeared to on the road to Damascus and spoken to him, who had revealed the gospel to him, who had revealed the mystery of Christ, who had been commissioned by Jesus to be the official spokesman to the Gentiles for him, I'll listen to everything that guy says. It's good enough for me, you know. If I want to add to that another layer to my belief that also all these guys who wrote the New Testament, something else was going on called inspiration while they wrote that they didn't mention. Okay, you can believe it if you want to, but then you have to work with these mistakes that they make, you know. Now, when Matthew said, Jeremiah the prophet wrote this, and he quotes from Zechariah, I think one of the easiest explanations is he forgot it was Zechariah, and he thought it was Jeremiah. But lots of people, their view of inspiration would be challenged by that. And so, like I said, there are other ways we can vindicate Matthew. There are other ways he could have said that and not been wrong, but it's kind of, kind of creative. Uh, <clears throat> and that's okay, because maybe he did mean it in one of these other ways that, that meant he wasn't wrong. But I, all I'm saying is, for my money, I don't care if Matthew remembered correctly or incorrectly which prophet he was quoting. The prophecy was a correct one. And... Uh, like I said, it's so common for preachers to say, Jesus said, and they quote Paul or something, you know. It happens all the time. It doesn't change anything about their sermon or, or the rightness of what they're saying. So nobody has to be like me in this respect. I've just been teaching for 45 years, and I've had to immerse myself in it enough to, to reach uh, some kind of a paradigm that fits all the data. And that meant I had to modify a little bit some of the assumptions I had going in, but they're not, it's not a modification that gives me any lack or diminishing of my uh, respect for the credibility of everything in the Bible. It's just that a, a person doesn't have to be inspired to be telling the truth. And what the New Testament writers claim is they're telling the truth. 
once in a while they say they're inspired or they're telling something that was previously revealed to them. So we know that God was behind their teachings. But in exactly what sense he was involved, 